Right, good evening, everybody. And we are on to Patriarchs. And we backtrack a little bit from what we did the last session to Genesis chapter 12 to look at uh, God's calling on Abraham. Uh, at that time, he was called Abram. And when God called Abram to leave his country, his people, and father's household to travel to a new land, God promised Abram great things. It's like a spiritual life. When we leave our old life behind, uh, God asks us to travel to a new land, which is eternal kingdom of God. And God promises us great things. And this was for Abraham. This was God's response to the significance man was trying to find in himself and his existence on earth. You know, when God created man, or if you recall Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, God gave man the commission to rule over the animals. So God gave man significance there, but what happened because of man's sin was he had to find his own significance. So this is where by the time of the Tower of Babel, we can compare God's calling in chapter 12, immediately after the Tower of Babel, that chapter, God's calling and covenant with Abram versus man's ambition in the time of the Tower of Babel, Genesis chapter 11. And so we see God's calling of Abram in 12 verses 2 and 3 is actually God's answer to the ambition of men. Okay, At the Tower of Babel, the significance that men chose to make of, of themselves. Take a look at what uh, men said. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, okay, this man moving eastward is a significant thing. They found, they found a plain in China that is Babylonia and settled there. And they said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and bitumen for mortar. So we have mentioned before in the earlier chapters that men advanced in technology. And in this technology, they used bricks, man-made, rather than something natural, material for building. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches the heavens so that we may, okay, you can see there, they are, they are planning the significance, so that we may make a name for ourselves. So mankind is trying to work on his significance, work on his fulfillment and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. So people moved eastward, as you see here, men moved eastward, right? And that's actually an indication that this is the Bible's way to say that they moved away, not just from the place where Noah settled after the flood, but more specifically moved away from God. So they were actually abandoning God. And we see the nature and character of God remains fundamentally the same from the very beginning. From the Tower of Babel till today, mankind still builds monuments. They want to build a tower, build a city with a tower, right? So today, mankind still builds monuments to manifest, to show his greatness and aspiration. Yeah, to make a name for himself, to, to fulfill, to fulfill himself. Yeah, and we see people still build towers today to reach the sky, to prove their greatness. Yeah, make a name for ourselves, to prove their intelligence, their wealth, their achievements, their capability, their power, their godlikeness. And this is the way and ambition of men. And see, today men are still doing the same thing. 
that they did at the Tower of Babel. Okay, and so we have uh, 10 of the world's tallest buildings. 10 of the world's tallest buildings. You start with uh, the lowest of the 10, you know, KL, a Petronas Tower, Twin Towers, at 452 meters. And then you have 482 meters going higher, and that is in Hong Kong. And then 491 meters. You see, they, they are just marginally uh, higher than each other. <laughs> They're trying to beat each other. 491 meters in Shanghai. And then the next one goes to uh, Taipei with 508 meters, Taipei 101. And then you have uh, New York with the One World Trade Center at 541 meters. And then you have the Mecca building, 601 meters. And then you have Shanghai again, Shanghai Tower at 623 meters. And then you have Dubai with the 828 meters. And then this tall one, the tallest so far at uh, Jeddah, 1,000 meters. So over crossing over one kilometer in height. So what happened at the Tower of Babel, people building tower is still happening today. Yeah. They are, they are putting God out of the picture and they are build, making a name for themselves to fulfill themselves. That's what man is doing. Okay, so basically we, we are looking for, we are aspiring for fulfillment and for significance, all of us. Yeah, that's, that's the thing that is within us. So when God called Abraham, he offered Abram and the people of faith coming after him the spiritual alternative of God's kingdom. God offered a greatness, okay? Greatness in the spiritual alternative of his kingdom. And so let's compare human ambition manifested from the Tower of Babel and we compare it with God's calling and how it will be fulfilled. Right? So... Chapter 11, Genesis, they said, come, let's make bricks, make them thoroughly. And so they used brick and they said, build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens. The purpose, to make a name for ourselves and then we won't be scattered over the face of the whole earth. And we see the, that mankind is ambitious. He uses his knowledge. Remember the the invention, God, God created science and God also created the knowledge of good and evil. So you have the science there for doing things of the physical realm on this earth and then knowledge of good and evil will be the spiritual morality. Morality, okay? So God, man uses his knowledge to make and build, to accomplish. Man uses or man wants to use his intelligence and abilities to achieve and build to fulfill the ambition and fulfillment in his heart. Make a name for himself, be like God. That's what the serpent promised Eve in the garden. When you eat the fruit, you will be like God. So men built cities to live together and assert influence and control over others. See, the idea that they build a city means the people will live in close proximity with each other. They will not be scattered over the face of the whole, whole earth. And with that, there will come hierarchy and people influence and control over others. This is the way of man to be great and make a name for himself. It is human effort for self. And this kind of achievement is transient. It is temporary, it is short-lasting, is to make a name for self, okay, and reach for the heavens to be godlike and to be divine if possible, or for fulfilling self. But let's take a look at what God offered to Abraham and God offers to people who follow after Abraham in faith. Huh? 
God says, I will make you into a great nation. Again, that will mean people. All right, just now, if we talk about a city, we talk about city, then you're just talking about technical things of human beings and the infrastructure. Yeah, so man, you see, is interested in technical things, interested in an infrastructure. But what God offers Abraham and people of faith is a nation. This is people, people, a community. Yeah, not just infrastructure, not just things, but people. I will make you into a great people, a great community, and I will bless you. So that is that part which is uh, personal, that part that is personal. God says, I will bless you. Okay, I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. That I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So this is God's offer to compare with man's ambition when building the Tower of Babel. God promises the worshipper to be made into a great nation, community, people, and be personally blessed. So there is the self level, the name will be great and a blessing to others. So this is a uh, community. They are a blessing that will be to all peoples on earth. So it's a global community. And the part, whoever curses you, I will curse. You see that whoever curses God's people will actually undermine the blessings that are meant to channel down to them through God's people. So if you can imagine it, three layers, God at the top most layer, and then the people of God who are responding to him in faith and obedience, and then those who are not worshippers of God. The blessings of God will filter down to the bless, to the worshippers, and from the worshippers to the others. But whoever curses God's people, so if they curse God's people, then the blessings that are supposed to come from God's people will not filter down to them. So they become cursed as they lose out on the blessings they would have received from blessing God's people. So that is one way that they will lose out the curse. Okay, that is one way that they lose out the curse. So as God's, uh, sorry, what might lose out the blessing and become cursed themselves. So as God's people, okay, now talking about this relevant to us, huh? as God's people, we, just like Abraham, will be the fathers of many nations, many peoples, when we engage in being part of the discipleship commission. So that one telescope from Abraham in all the way into Jesus and the New Testament, right, for all mankind, that's, that's the blessing of God through Abraham. It will be a blessing from Abraham to all mankind. And so all mankind can participate in that blessing by being involved in the discipleship commission that Jesus transmitted to his disciples. And with this continuing chain of discipleship, each person, each believer, each disciple can spiritually parent children of God. And we will be spiritual parents, just like Paul, of spiritual children like Timothy, who will go on in successive generations. And so that is a people who are being blessed. Community, collectively, the con continuity of discipleship enables everyone who commits self to bless others and to be blessed themselves spiritually. All right, so in... A, diff, a slightly different way of looking at it, this whole blessing, okay, this whole blessing can actually work out through discipleship where everybody can be made into a great nation. Our name can be great because each one of us 
participate in the blessing and the promise of God. And we are blessing the people on earth. All peoples on earth will be blessed, first by Abraham and the rest of us who are also participating in continuing this discipleship commission of Jesus. So this is the way of God that can make each person great. Each one of us can be great. Uh, of course, this requires human effort. We require participation. We require cooperation with God to trust, to obey and trust him in our generation. So each generation, each person in the generation can become a blessing even as they are blessed. So all people are blessed. And even though it's not obvious at this stage, it will last, it will telescope into eternity. Okay, so having said this, having covered this part about God's offer of greatness, okay, uh, I want us to look at the next aspect of God's knowledge and wisdom. Okay, this one serves a purpose to bless Abraham and his descendants and the people of the world. But God actually, if we think carefully about what God is doing, there's another very important dimension that God is accomplishing through this call. When people were living together in one place, from the time of Adam to the Tower of Babel, Remember that is from Genesis 1 to chapter 11. They all shared one language and they had collective knowledge of God and what he had done. So, for example, when we saw Cain, right? Cain, uh, he, he was, after he killed his brother Abel, he had a mark on him and God said whoever killed Cain would suffer vengeance seven times. And then other people knew because Generations later, Lamech talked about Cain. Okay, So those people of their time, they were all living together in such a way that they knew information about God. Together as a people, they had information, they had knowledge. Then we see that as people multiplied and spread across the earth, and that's what we see in Genesis 10 with the Tower of Na a Table of Nations, and particularly after the Tower of Babel, when God dispersed all the people. Now, God knew that with this dispersal, people would forget him in time. Okay, so this is a significant thing that will happen. When people disperse from the Tower of Babel across the nations, God knew people would forget him in time. And the first generation of people groups that spread across the world knew God and his truth, just like the people of Adam and the earlier generations. They would know because they were living together. All right? They knew. So the first generation of people that spread across the earth knew God and God's truth, including what he had done from the story of Adam and Eve up to the Tower of Babel. And they would carry this knowledge of God with them wherever they settled on the earth, whichever country. Remember Pen Pangea? They were all dispersing. Excuse me, I got to shut my window because of the storm coming in. Okay, sorry. So, so knowing that God, God knowing that people would forget him, people would abandon him, people would neglect or reject the knowledge of God, okay? Uh, the first generations would carry this knowledge of God with them wherever they settled on the earth or dispersed on the different continents. But with the passing of time and new generations, their future descendants would make choices that cut away or reject any worship or awareness of God. Okay, so God knew that this is what would happen for themselves. The first generation of the dispersed nations from Genesis chapter 10, they might find ways 
to retain some knowledge of God in their traditions and cultures. All right, so through just like you know the Passover for the Jews, they, they have they have a Passover feast, and that one they will recall uh, the deliverance of God from Egypt and so on. So for the first generation of the dispersed nations, they might have some of their traditions and cultures that have awareness of God. And in some way, they might preserve some essential awareness of God and its key of salvation for their dispersed generations through their own separate languages, traditions, and customs to, in order for their future generations to know and perhaps return to their creator God, right? Because they have knowledge of God in their traditions and cultures. For example, we have the Chinese. The Chinese people preserve the earlier stories of creation, of the ark and the flood in the pictographs of their language. We will look at some examples later. Pictographs are the Chinese characters long ago. They are just like pictures. They're just like pictures. They are words, but words in the form of pictures. So this is for the people, the first generation of the dispersed nations, how they might retain some knowledge of God to pass to their future generations. Then we see on the other hand that God knew in time as the population on earth increased. Yeah? New generations would grow up and they would abandon their knowledge of him and focus totally on the natural ways of men. Take a look at one example from Romans 1, 18 to 23. So if somebody can help us look at that chapter and read for us. Romans 1, 18 to 23. Can someone read for us? Yeah, read Romans 1, uh, verse 18. Uh, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since, that, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world invisible, of the world God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal men and birds and animals and reptiles. Thank you, Magdalene. Okay, so here you see that the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men. So people choose not to have God in their lives and they became wicked and they suppress the truth of God by their wickedness. Because you see, God is plain to them uh, for true creation, the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities of his power and his divine nature. Remember, God gave the commission to Adam and Eve, rule over the animals to show that God is a very good God. It's God is a loving God, a gracious God. So nature, God's divine nature is actually seen in creation, right? And people, however, they knew God, but they neither glorified him. Verse 21, they refused to glorify him and uh, refused to give thanks to him. 
right? And so their foolish, darkened, foolish hearts were darkened. And even though they claim to be wise, you see, they, how, are, how they are able to uh, advance in technology and do such wonderful things. Like even up to today, they're building all these towers that reach hundreds and hundreds of meters, right? Um, so they became fools, right? They claimed to be wise, but they came, became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for other things, for idols, Right? So you see that God knew all these things would happen with the dispersal of human beings from the Tower of Babel. Right? So while the Bible does not tell us uh, these things explicitly, all right, when we read and understand the story of the Bible and the significance, what all these developments mean, we can see that God actually put in place something, something, so that he can bring men back to himself. Because many people would become godless, wicked, and suppress the truth of God. So God is doing something for the benefit of the world where people who are willing to may receive God. All right? So these, these people who, in their, as new ger generations go on, as they abandon God, they would uh, ignore him and choose their own ways of being good and moral without regard for him. Yeah, so people will come up with their own sense of what is good, right and wrong. Like nowadays, you know, everything is subjective. It all depends on each individual. Not necessarily everybody believes or turns to God for their right and wrong. So some of the earlier generations of the dispersed nations from Babel might base their standard of morality on gods, but in time with the passing of generations, even up to today, many would no longer retain God's morality. So they are right and wrong, you know, it's up to them to decide, it's not up to God. As they live more and more for themselves, they suppress God's truth, they reject it. So to enable men to still be able to find their way back to God, that is the wisdom and the power of God. God chose Abram, okay, so that the world will not be total darkness where God is concerned. God chose Abram, who faithfully preserved his knowledge and worship of God. Okay, the last session, we talked about why did God choose Abram, and we saw the Bible says because he was faithful. Okay, so each one of us can be faithful. So each one of us can be just like Abraham. Okay, for Abraham, he would serve as the father of faith, that model. The father of faith or the model of a worshipper who would choose God and follow God's way and follow God's way faithfully. So, through Abram and his descendants, God would preserve knowledge of him and his truth so that those who would worship the creator God would continue to bear God's truth, reality, and presence. Okay, so here God is choosing a group of people who that are biological, right? A, a physical group, a physical race of people whom today we identify as the Jews, right? And they would preserve knowledge of him and continue to bear his truth, reality, and presence because God watches over them. God blesses them. And under God's preservation as his chosen people, God protects their existence. They would also multiply and convey God's blessings and salvation to the nations, of people groups scattered throughout the world. This is the role God's nation called Israel will bear as a literal testimony. Literal testimony to the world about God's existence and reality. And after Christ brings salvation to the earth, God will add the community called Christians to bear spiritual testimony to the eternal kingdom of heaven 
of God Almighty, Creator, and the eternal Alpha and Omega, beginning and end. Okay, so God is actually uh, doing something in his great foreknowledge, God's great foreknowledge of what would happen to mankind. So he chose Abraham, right, to preserve the knowledge and then eventually knowledge of God through the Christians. So let's take a little bit, uh, take a little peek today at uh, the Chinese language. Just now I said that God used various customs and traditions of, of the people groups that dispersed. Okay. Now I don't know, I have no idea whether God does that for every people group. Okay, but certainly God has done it for people groups that over time have responded and uh, we look at the, the Chinese language as an example of that redemption, what, what a, a person called Don Richardson calls the redemption analogy. We'll look at that in a, a little while. Let's look at this first. Huh? Chinese language confirm Genesis and Bible stories. 70% of ancient Chinese characters have parallels to Bible stories that don't make sense unless the Bible writers and Chinese writers, both Bible and Chinese writers, were talking about this true event in their history. Okay, so if you want more information, you can go to this website. And for example, let's take a look at some of these characters. Uh, those who are good at Chinese, please help me out with this. What's this word? Zhao. Zhao. Okay, what is Zhao? Like build or create or make something. Thank you very much. So Zhao is to create and it is actually made up of these uh, of these, uh, these parts. Okay, you have this part. Is this a word by itself? Is this a word by itself, the, those who are good in Chinese? Just so I'm not so sure. Okay. So it so the word zao, huh? okay, is this part actually? And you can see it's here. Is actually together with this part here. You can see all these parts. This word zao has all these parts here. This part here means speak. And this part is the tu, which is a dust or mud. And this little indication is life. And this one indicates movement or walk. Right. So this is from the book called The Discovery of Genesis by these authors. And then you have this word is one, correct? One is complete or finish. And you look at how it is made with this thing here. Okay, this character. And this character is made up of this one. Down here, this part here is a two in Chinese. And this part is a run. Right, it's a person, and together it forms first. And those who read Chinese, this is the word, if, I be, if I'm correct, it's the word yuan, which is first. So you have yuan first, plus this covering on top is actually a picture of a home. So you put a picture of a home with a first in front, first below, yuan, becomes complete. Okay, so that's a word there. And then you have another word. This one, the whole thing is a boat. Now, this boat is made up of three parts. You have the first part here, which is vessel. And it's interesting because this vessel is written like this, like an arc, but two, late, two levels, not three levels. Two levels. And then you have the figure eight, Chinese eight. And then you have the ko, which means people. So the boat is made up of a vessel with eight people inside. Right? That's very interesting. That tells us the story of Noah and the ark. So what we have for this part here is you, you want to look up, you can go to this uh, website. Huh? Okay. Now the Chinese may have preserved some knowledge of 
some of the events in the Bible prior to the scattering of peoples from the incident of the Tower of Babel. So before the Tower of Babel, they have already preserved some of this knowledge, some of these events. And according to legend, Chinese characters were invented by Chang Jie, a bureaucrat under the legendary Yellow Emperor. Translate is Huang Di. Yeah, Yellow Emperor is Huang Di, the, the king. The earliest confirmed evidence of the Chinese script, the Chinese handwriting, uh, the, the characters of the Chinese words, yet discovered is the body of the inscriptions on oracle bones from the late Shang dynasty. And that is circa estimated 1200 to 1050 BC, before Christ. So the original Chinese characters, I said pictographs, they were actually in they were actually written or carved on oracle bones. They were actually on bones, the characters. You can check out Wikipedia on Chinese characters. So Chinese characters are essentially the symbolic representation of words. There are over 600 symbols, Chinese characters, okay, of Chinese characters. And some were changed in the 20th century. Most still are essentially the same as they were thousands of years ago. Why were they changed? In the 1950s, China nearly decided to abolish characters. Okay, and even now, most Chinese are not taught the history and tradition behind their writing system. So they were trying to change the characters, the words, what we call simplify them. Yeah, uh, I think the Chinese call jian ti zi simplify the, the characters. But the original characters, quite complicated, is because they, they were telling a story. Yeah, the original characters were quite complicated because they were telling a story. So let's see. Okay, uh, anyway, the characters had to start from somewhere and biblically, they would have started sometime after the construction of the Tower of Babel. Some have suggested that perhaps these characters help demonstrate that the Chinese characters show that they are familiar with some of the events recorded in the first chapters of the book of Genesis. For example, Genesis records, chapter 2, verse 8, 9, 10, the Lord God planted a garden. So you have this picture, the garden here, eastward in Eden. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from there it parted and became four riverways. So you have garden, garden, and it became four river hits. So the term, the English term garden can be translated by the Chinese word tian. Right, which is the symbol shown below, Tian, garden. Now this word Tian can also mean farm or field. Right, so this word can have the meaning of garden, farm or field. You can therefore imagine in terms of Chinese, God created this garden, this gar uh, garden, farm or field yeah, in Eden. And it is four irrigation channels. So it's surrounded by four within an area of land. Or it possibly may be the four rivers with a type of tree in the middle of it. Okay, so something that represents a tree there inside. There were two famous trees in the Garden of Eden. You have the tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, Genesis 2.9. And God gave Adam one command after placing him in the garden. Then the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. That is chapter 2, 15 to 17. It is of interest to note the Chinese character Chinese symbol for prohibition. Yeah? 
Chinese symbol for prohibition is the combination of the symbols for two trees. Mu, eh? two trees and the word Kaman. How to read this Chinese character, the blue one? Uh, Georgina or whoever. Jing. Jing, eh? Jing. See, this, no, this part, the blue one, this one. The whole thing is Jing, right? I'm not sure. Yeah, okay, Jing Zi, Jing. Yeah. Okay, Jing Zi, yeah. So Jing Zi, the Jing means prohibit. Okay, so the word is actually made up of two trees with this bottom character. Looks like a two and a xiao in Chinese. Okay, so this is a mu or a tree. Two of them with this divine command. So it should be noted that God, while he originally prohibited one tree, later prohibited access to the second tree in chapter 3 verse 22 to 24 he also he didn't allow them to eat from the tree of life either after men sinned so that is prohibit okay so you can see the character has something connected to the story of genesis then if stated we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. Chapter 3, verse 2. And you see the Chinese symbol for fruit is combining the symbols for tree and garden. So you have the garden here and the symbol for tree, the mu and the tian. And mu and the tian, this word fruit is made up of, there you have the tree and the garden, the pictures. And one more, you have ta, which is tower and the, the word tower is made up of the green part the grass then you have this black part which is the two or the clay and then this one is run mankind and then you have one e and then you have ko which is one mouth right so meaning one person so the tower of babel was built with bricks which is a combination of grass and clay and humans originally had one language or mouth, one mouth, one language. It is possible that this symbol is showing that the ancient Chinese recognized a connection to the biblical Tower of Babel. See the word Ta is the Tower of Babel. And all the parts that make up the word have some connection, some relationship with the story. All right, so it's very interesting how the Chinese characters are telling the story of first uh, in Genesis. Okay, now through the ancient Chinese pictographs, the picto is part, uh, means picture, pictographs, right? And other, what is called redemption analogies. Redemption is to save people, right? Analogy is a, a likeness, something that is uh, connected. God leaves signs and evidence of himself. So can you imagine God actually, when, when the people in chapter Genesis 10 dispersed in their tables of nations, God allowed them, we don't know how many nations, how many people groups, to carry with them something within their traditions and cultures that they would practice. They would carry some signs and evidence of God and God's truth in their, we call it primitive because that was really long ago, primitive human societies that dispersed from the Tower of Babel and then formed into the nations of the world. And people groups that spread out into the world carried some truths of God with them awaiting a Kairos time, right? For those who uh, follow the idea of study of Greek, uh, Greek words, Kairos is time of significance when something is being achieved. Okay, so waiting the significant time when someone, for example, missionaries, brings the gospel key, the gospel of salvation, bring that gospel key to unlock the message of salvation in their culture or tradition and release them into the salvation of Christ. And we have one example, the story of peace child Okay, the story of Peace Child is an example of God's redemption analogy. Okay, so the Chinese language actually has 
something that tells us about Genesis, then Peace Child is uh, one of the traditions of the head hunting Sawi tribe who were cannibals. Now, the Sawi tribe, they live in a part of Indonesia. Okay, there are Sawi tribes from Indonesia. Missionaries Dawn and Carol Richardson, his wife, they discovered the key to this Sawi tribe's tradition that enabled them to unlock the gospel of salvation for them. Let's take a look, little look at this uh, description of the movie, okay? And then I will show you the, uh, I'll show you the trailer. And at your own time, I'm sorry, you can't watch the movie unless you you understand uh, Spanish. Okay, the trailer here tells us that the film was filmed in the unspot jungles of the Southwest Pacific, right? But they were from one of the Indonesian islands. Peace Child dramatically portrays the startling reaction of Stone Age people to the gospel. Dawn and Carol Richardson respond to the call of Christ to be missionaries and careful preparation for their mission and a journey by duck out canoe. Bring them to a remote rainforest inhabited by some of the world's most primitive people. Painstakingly, they learn the language only to be shocked when the story of Judas's betrayal of Jesus makes him a hero to a people whose highest attribute is to be masters of treachery. You see, when, when Don Richardson and his wife, uh, Carol, they learned how, they learned how to speak the, the language of the Sawis, they managed to share the gospel. But when they talk about Judas betraying Jesus, the people actually clapped. They clapped for Judas because they think that in their culture, if you are good enough to trick your enemy into believing and trusting you, come to your house to have a fellowship meal, all right, and then you kill the enemy who trusts you, you are a hero. That is, their, that is their kind of culture, okay? Master, master of treachery. If you can betray, if you can trick somebody to trust you, especially trick your enemy to trust you, right? And you can kill your enemy because of that. You are fantastic. So when Don Richardson first shared the gospel and told them about Judas, they, they applauded for Judas. But something happened much later on, okay? When inter-tribal warfare breaks out, because these Sawi people, their tribes, huh? they, they're constantly fighting each other. They constantly fight each other and their prize would be if they kill somebody, remember they are headhunters. Yeah, they're headhunters and they're cannibals. So if they kill somebody, they cut off the head and the head, the skull is kept in their, in their heart as a prize of their victory. And as, as cannibals, of course, they eat people, right? So when inter-tribal warfare breaks out, the battles continue. And what happened was John Richardson and his wife, who were missionaries there, uh, the people welcomed them, okay? The people welcomed them because they brought, they brought some benefits to the people. But when war broke out, they, want, they told the people, the tribes that they wanted to leave since, since the people were not responding to them. And so what happened is the people did not want to uh, lose Don and his wife. So they agreed to be at peace with each other. So what happens is they acted out a ceremony. They acted out a ceremony where a warring chief offers his baby son, baby, as a means of bringing lasting peace. He offers his baby son to an enemy tribe or the enemy tribe to bring up that baby son okay so this is peace letting your enemy tribe bring up your baby son as one of their own and as long as that baby son is alive the tribes cannot go to war with each other 
the tribes cannot fight each other as long as that child is alive. And that child is called peace child. Okay? And so with this, with this uh, ritual of peace among the warring tribes, their tribal custom makes the gospel understandable. Don Richardson and his wife, they got the key to open the gospel to these people, gospel of salvation. And they told the people that Jesus is that peace child. Jesus is that peace child. So when the people understood that Jesus is that peace child, their whole understanding of Judas changed. Because you see, to them, you can betray your enemy, but you cannot betray the peace child. That is really amazing. Okay, so Don Richardson says that the peace child is the child God has given to us, given to you, Sawi tribe people, so that you and God will not be at war. You and God will not be enemies, so that you and God can live in peace. And because they were able to therefore bring this, bring an understanding to their tribal custom related to the gospel, they accepted Christ and lives were changed. The Sabi tribe, tribal people accepted Christ as their personal savior and a church appeared. So Peace Child is an exceptional film blending ferocious inter-tribal warfare, expert cinematography and Christian compassion in a dramatic recreation of a classic missions success story. Right, using the idea of the redemption analogy just now I said, right, redemption analogy. Salvation analogy of God that is hidden inside the tradition of a primitive society that probably had its uh, tradition long ago, somehow from the Tower of Babel or, or something. Okay, but the fact that you have a peace child ritual, talking about salvation is really an incredible redemption analogy God has placed in their tradition. Okay, so this, this film contains some brief nudity in the fashion, native fashion, meaning that uh, you see some naked women because that was their tribe, that they, they didn't wear clothes and, at that time as a tribe, primitive tribe. Okay, so um, I'm go just going to move there to the, to the uh, YouTube website to show you the trailer. The, the movie itself is now dubbed in Spanish. So unfortunately, being in Spanish, uh, we, we will not understand it. So what happens is uh, this... This movie, actually, the original movie, I think was uh, somewhere around uh, 1972, same title, Peace Child. If anybody is able to get an English version, uh, that would be good. I might have an English version somewhere, saved somewhere, but uh, I will have to go and look for it. Okay, but um, you have this trailer based on the book Peace Child, A True Story by Don Richardson filmed in this place, New Guinea. Okay, and then we have this. So we have this, uh, ex another documentary. Uh, I think that's an advertisement, just be a bit patient. But this documentary where- I refuse to spend money on <laughs> parking and taxis. Sorry. Let's be a, patient, um, a bit patient while I, okay, skip this. Okay, that's a documentary uh, of, that's a documentary shot by uh, Don Richardson's sons. You can see the title, Never the Same, Celebrating 50 Years Since Peace Child. And this documentary shows his sons and him going back to visit the Sawi tribe. Uh, Alfred, we're still seeing your your, your screen of the words. Oh, so sorry. My apologies. Oh, you didn't tell me the... Okay, okay. Hold on. Huh? 
I will have to share. Okay. I don't. Oh, okay. I have to stop share. I'm apologies. Thank you for telling me. If y'all don't see the screen that I'm describing, y'all let me know. Okay. Okay. So can y'all see the screen now? Yes. Okay. Can uh, let me let me go back there. I'm so sorry. This is a documentary celebrating 50 years since child, where the the sons of Don Richardson and he went back to visit the child. I just look at a. It was 50 years ago when my mother and my father began an unforgettable journey. This is the couple. They are acting themselves. I was just seven months old when they moved deep into the jungles of Papua. We made our home among a small tribal group known as the Sawi. My dad learned the language. My mom treated the sick. All with the purpose of telling them about Jesus. But the people did not respond. The Sawi were headhunters. They were cannibals. They lived in a constant state of war. As time passed, we began to lose hope that the gospel would take root. My parents were faced with a decision. Finally, Dad explained to the Sawi that if they kept on fighting, we could no longer stay. But the Sawi were desperate to keep us around, so they finally agreed to make peace with each other. In order for that to happen, each Sawi village gave an infant, a baby boy, to their enemies. And this child became known as the peace child. It was through this unexpected exchange, buried deep in their culture, that my parents were given a perfect opportunity to share the gospel with the Sawi, to explain to them that God sent his very own peace child, Jesus, to make peace with us. It's been 50 years since that day, and we're very anxious to see how the Sawi are doing. It's uh, fairly early in the morning on June 23rd, and everybody's still asleep. And I'm, this is the day. I'm on my way. I was up pretty late last night making sure that I had everything I needed. And I hope I haven't forgotten anything. I got quite a few gifts for people. I think I'm set to go. It's been almost 25 years now since I've been there. I don't know how much things have changed. It's possible that a lot of the people that I know are no longer alive. But uh, I think some of my friends will still be there and it's going to be an amazing reunion with them. Joining my two brothers, Shannon and Paul. My dad just turned 77 and this is his first time back in many, many years. So for our family, for my brothers and my dad and I, this is the trip of a lifetime. So now we climb. All we do is climb. And we'll just keep on climbing until the day. Kaigar tribesmen from upriver, and they're the ones who actually uh, paddled our family in on this very river. And a couple of three of these guys were actually the actual paddlers from that time. It's, I couldn't believe this. <laughs> he's so proud because he said we gave them to the Sawi. Yeah, they're real proud because they said they gave up the mom and dad and gave them to the Sawi. <laughs> they're enemy tribes. So not kind of, so, yeah. Her father was one of the paddlers, and he he died, so she's taking his place. She's taking these, his place. These two women are the daughters of the paddlers who brought oh, okay. mom and dad. And they have their weapons in their canoes here to reenact the fact that they brought their weapons uh, because they were heading into enemy territory. So each person is here with a meaning. There's symbolism in each person's presence on this little uh, flotilla of three canoes. Just have taken us to the same place where we landed. Yeah, to the very same spot.
Normally you wouldn't hear someone say, it's great to see so many old people. Disease took its toll. Death from warfare took its toll. But now to come back and see that there are just throngs among the crowds of people, throngs of people with gray hair and old enough that they have trouble walking along the trail, that's a special joy. So they've reached out and they've invited I think five tribes around them. So they're making themselves a base uh, because something really significant happened among them. And it seems like this has been implanted in the hearts of the Sawi that they aren't meant to just sit around enjoying Christ and getting fat and happy. The whole point is to reach out and share it with others. So they're doing that. It's, we're seeing it in action. Yeah. He's explaining he's from a remote village. And after the Bible was translated, someone brought the scriptures to him and he believed. Isaac. He's, he's taken a Christian name called Isaac. They really rolled out the red carpet. Hundreds and hundreds of people from five different tribes were here. And for me, the emotion was just overwhelming. I think one of the things that struck me, maybe the most, was how many people grabbed my hand or gave me a hug, often with tears in their eyes, and said that they had been my close friend or playmate when I was little. And I was surprised how many of the older people are still alive who actually witnessed my parents' arrival. So it's amazing to see the legacy of God's grace through my parents in their obedient step of faith 50 years ago. So, assuming it was 15 at each time, that's 325. Some missionaries here from other parts of the country who are helping to educate and disciple and reinforce the work of those parents with the younger generation. And all of them generation. have read Peace Child. And they've all been influenced by Peace Child. <laughs> That's a big reason why they're here. Yeah. yeah. It's like a dream for them to go to the And these place. are marvelous young men and women yeah, from other cultures, from distant parts of the country, who've come here to build on the foundation that, that our family laid. God's word has been planted here, the gospel has been received, the place is full of peace, it's a safe place to live. We're very blessed. I want to give thanks to God because the gospel came here. And I want you to know that when you leave on the airplane tomorrow, that we're going to stay faithful to the gospel as long as we live. It's everything to us. Goodbye and God bless you, he says. <laughs> the younger generation is really thriving. There are lots of challenges, but they're, they're aggressive. They're, um, they're taking places of leadership. I'm impressed with the desire to progress, the desire to make an impact. encouraged that these tribes that used to be mortal enemies are so close to each other now. They, they see themselves almost as one. The old tribal barriers and divisions that I sensed and knew as a child have long since broken down. And they really feel themselves as being one people. Part of that is because they, they share a sense of significance and identity by virtue of their story that has been told.
Okay, so we have a Our trip to Kamur and the reunion with the Sawi reminded me what an incredible privilege it is to join God in his journey to the nations. Okay, so um, I've got the the web the YouTube website there for you for that, that a movie we've watched quite a big part of it. It's only about 15 minutes uh, celebrating 50 years since Peace Child. All right, so um, you see, the wisdom of God is such that, yes, the world of people have dispersed and people do not know God, people do not worship God, but somehow God has left evidence of himself. Yeah, and you see, within, within people, there, this, the hearts of people, there is something that God has left, which is very significant. Maybe somebody can turn for us to Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. What God has left in men so that it is possible for men to find, for lost men to find God again. Ecclesiastes 3, 11. Okay, uh, Ecclesiastes 3, 11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. Thank you. Okay, so God has set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom, they cannot understand what God has done from beginning to end. Right? Okay, so you see that uh, the gospel of God, the truth of God is so amazing that we cannot understand these truths. And yet, somehow, God will make it possible for mankind to find him. And so for each one of us, it is just, it's, it's just a simple matter of God wanting each one of us not to worry whether, you know, people in other countries, people wherever else, uh, whether they they, are, they have a chance to receive Christ and so on. We just work on our salvation and work on being faithful and obedient. God will do what is necessary for the rest so that when we go to heaven one day because we have not, we have not doubted God and you know, we, we don't carry this issue within our hearts that oh yeah, God didn't bring salvation for those people, those people, those people. Worry about our own salvation right and then if you want you can be somebody like carol and don richardson who went out with the gospel to reach people right so god has left evidence of himself and it is truly amazing if we can only see how god works but we are finite okay so last few minutes anybody has anything you want to share or any insight I was uh, wondering how, how tall is the uh, Tower of Babel. And in fact, I, I go to a Google search and actually to my surprise, I don't know whether it's true or not, that it's about three times the height of the uh, Burj Khalifa. Three times the height of? Burj Khalifa. So we mentioned it's very this high. This one. That with two, point, two, two plus kilometers high. Yeah. Very high. So, I mean, imagine at that, at that time they are able to build such a high structure. Very amazing. Uh, without the modern technology, that would be very challenging and probably take a lot of time. But, well, we don't know. Mm -hmm. So, the point again is a uh, mankind making significance of himself, trying to fulfill himself without yeah. God. Yeah. Right. So when we try to fulfill ourselves, whatever we can achieve that is outstanding in this world, 
without God, it will all come to nothing one day. Just like, you know, the Tower of Babel is now just an ancient ruin. Yeah, and it doesn't last forever. But the, the offer of God to Abraham and the people of faith is something that will be eternal and something that we can benefit the people of the world as you know, we disciple people and it reaches out into different countries. You never know when you disciple somebody who goes into another country and they disciple other people who go into yet other countries, right? So we can actually make an impact on the world. And that's, that's a, a way of looking at how God says that all peoples on earth will be blessed through you, whether from Abraham or from us today. The important thing is, Faithful. God found Abraham faithful. May God find the same in us. Okay, anybody else? Thank you, Robert, for that sharing. Okay, so if nothing else, uh, what I would suggest you do is from now on, we're going to go through the stories a lot faster than what I did with the first 11 chapters. So my suggestion is you read a hit of, read a few chapters, because uh, what I'm going to do is I will be doing the chapters a lot faster as stories and pull out significance and so on. Okay. So next lesson, Genesis 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, maybe. Uh, try to do as much as possible in one lesson. Okay. So um, any final thing? If not, then we're going to pray today. Anybody else contribute with a, uh, don't, you have to unmute yourself, Georgina, if you have something to contribute or say. Oh, no, I don't, I don't have. Okay, right. So shall we pray? Let's pray then. Huh? Okay, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that in your wisdom and your great ability to do things and to plan things in such a way that we we, we simply cannot understand all the different things that you are taking care of, you are preparing, and that you are doing for each one of us as well as for the rest of the world and this, this planet. Father, we thank you for such grace. We thank you for all the things that you have made possible for us and even for us to be able to share in eternal life and an eternal destiny that will be indeed be glorious. And we pray, Father God, as we contemplate on these things that we will be faithful as you require so that we will achieve the eternal destiny that you have actually uh, in store for us by our faithfulness and our obedience to what you have uh, told us to do in your word. And so, Father, we worship you. We give you the glory, honor, and we love you and give you thanks and praise. For all this we say in Jesus' name, amen.